tapes we're talking about, <laughs> folks, have to be turned over once in a while. Uh, Krupa was in Buddy Rogers' band. Buddy Rogers was a movie actor, and uh, I think he played like 13 instruments. And supposedly uh, Hammond was saying, "Come on, you got to come to New York. Goodman has this great band. They're playing some swing arrangements." And Krupa said, "Forget, it. I'm not. No, no more jazz. I want to make a living and all that kind of stuff." And then supposedly <laughs> Buddy Rogers picked up the trombone or something like that. And Krupa said, "Okay, I'll meet you there next week." And he joined Benny Goodman, and it turned out to be a very fortuitous event because it was through that association, as everyone knows, that Sing, 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 and all that stuff really, really happened. Well, you see, yeah, that was that was that could have been, you know, Gene, you know, Gene, Gene was a, was a very, you know, out of all the drummers in the, of those days, you know, Gene was a very handsome young guy. Oh yeah, you know, a lot of people didn't even know he was Polish, you know, because you usually associate Polish with, with uh, uh, blonde hair, you know, blue eyes, and uh, yeah, and uh, so on, you know, and here's this guy with black hair. He had black hair and dark eyes, you know, and uh, he looked Italian. You know, he had that that Latin look, you know. Yeah. And the chicks went nuts for him, you know. And he, and uh, and he had a class about him, you know. I mean, I knew that since I was a kid. But when I when I first met him, when he, when I became his little pal, you know, uh, uh, there was something about him about the way he carried himself, you know. That, and uh, there were uh, uh, Hollywood beckoned, you know. It was the same with Buddy, you know, uh, this star thing, you know. And so I could see how easily we could have lost him if it wasn't that he had such musical sense. And like everybody else that loves music more than the other scene, you find out that Hollywood was a dumb scene, you know. It always was, it still is, you know. I mean, it really is not a great place to be, you know. I mean, if you want to really be involved in music, you know, real music. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, there were some fantastic musicians out there working in the studio orchestras, but that isn't where they wanted Gene. Right. It wasn't a matter of being in a big pit orchestra. I mean, when you listen to some of the music that's been, and when you hear these old films, when you see the old films and you hear what's going on in the background, there's some musicianship there, you know. Mm. And there's some heavy drumming by some excellent drummers, you know. Uh, that's what vaudeville drumming I'm talking about. I mean, some of that kind of drumming. Mm. Those guys catching all those Busby Berkeley stuff and all that. I mean, that's some, you got to read, you know, and you got to play. It's... And you get one shot at those things. They, they, no time for extra rehearsals. Yeah. It, uh, that called for another kind of person, you know. And uh, that wasn't for, that wasn't for a guy like G. Krupa. Yeah. So I could see where uh, it wouldn't take much to get him to scare him out of there and get him back to New York where the playing was. Yeah, that's uh, one thing about him. When people say Gene Krupa, they think of Gene Krupa. Well, first of all, first thing that comes to mind for many people, even people from younger generations, is the very uh, stupid, I have to say, and, uh, and, and bum rap he got with the whole drug thing and, 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 and all oh. that. And it's, I, I, I think it's worth mentioning just quickly just to dis dispel that rumor about dr Gene oh, Krupa, a drug that, fiend that, that, that and was all a that total, stuff. That was a total uh, setup. Set it was a yeah. frame, framing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I knew that. I know that you knew it, but I bet you yeah. mo most people don't. No, no, of course not, because... Because once they, you know, your, yeah. uh, our our wonderful press, like uh, the, as always, just even today, the, once they hit with something on page one, and then when they're when you're proven not guilty and everything is uh, everything is they're wrong, uh, that that's on page forty. You right, know. if you're lucky. Yeah. Basically, Krupa was set up with that whole marijuana thing and the whole drug thing, and uh, you know he probably like a lot of other musicians that's probably he wouldn't go along with a certain with uh, you know there there was some big Big time agencies, agencies running everything, and Gene, re you know, a lot of I know other musicians who were wiped out of the business, yeah, because they refused to go along with uh, with this uh, gangsterism, yeah, basically, yeah. you'll be with us or else routine, and Gene didn't want to do that, so they said, all right, we'll, we'll fix you. Yeah, the funny bit is, uh, it 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 hurt him. It did hurt him because it gave him the reputation of being a dope addict. Yeah, and it, it was a lovely... Talk, yeah, I mean, he was... Yeah, and he, I mean, it just wasn't true, you know. What and what what was he like as a person? Oh, he was a sweetheart, man. Uh, he was one of the... He was one of the... Which is probably one of the reasons he wasn't as successful uh, a band leader as, uh, as uh, people like Goodman and Dorsey. and Dorsey and them because he was a nice guy. The guys loved him. He was fun to work with, and he treated everybody nice. I... I saw him in action too. I mean, and, and you talk to guys that were in his band, you know, mm -hmm. and they'll say, "Oh, Gene was, he was a, like Sam Donahue, you know, but all those, you know, the, he was the lovely person to work for. He, yeah, 
He treated the musicians great. He loved great musicians, you know. He liked good music. He always he had good players in his band. He had a lot of great young players. Yes, he did. His band didn't get the credit like uh, at a time, you know, when Woody's band, you know, in the middle 40s, Gene had a one hell of a good band with young beboppers coming up that could play, you know, yeah. that were all on that same kick, you know. Yeah. Uh, Buddy Wise, Mitch Melnick. Red uh, Rodney. Red, sure, Red. Jim, Lenny Hambro, uh, Irby Green. Jerry Mulligan. Uh, Frank Rossellino, Jerry Mulligan. Yeah. Those were all the uh, guy named Dick Taylor. Yeah. Don Fagerquist. Fagerquist. Ray Triscary. I mean, these guys were all coming up on that same time and could play, really. You listen to, you listen to his band at that time. Yeah. That's an excellent, excellent band. Well, we're going to hear that band in just a moment as, 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 as we get there. But we'll keep you waiting for a moment because I want to play a few <coughs> er earlier recordings by Gene. The first one I want to play is uh, one that just shows him as he became famous. And, of course, that was as a member of the Benny Goodman band. And I guess that was the first time, really, that a drummer became uh, such a personality in a band yeah. as a sideman. I guess it. it was really unheard of. If you wanted to be... a a drummer that was known, you were the leader at that point. It wasn't, you but to if be. you were in someone's band, it was unheard of. And uh, eventually, Krupa left Goodman's band because he became as popular or more popular than Benny, and Benny couldn't handle it, and it's easy to understand yeah. why. What we're going to hear right now, instead of uh, spending a lot of time with the original recording of Sing, 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 which is a long one, we're going to listen to a version of Caravan. It was never commercially recorded. Uh, it was arranged by Jimmy Mundy, and it gave Gene a chance to do kind of a sing-sing-sing thing. You'll hear him do a lot of tom-tom, but then he also swings the band and plays some great snare drum and hi-hat work. And then we'll come back and talk. So, Mel Lewis, The History of Jazz Drums at 6.53. And this is WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. Let's go to Gene Krupa, and then we'll come back and analyze it with Mel Lewis.
Well, that was Benny Goodman's band live on the radio with Caravan. See, now that was that was rapping, I and mean, it was there was the, the which shows you, you know, what Gene Gene really could swing hard. You know, I did a blindfold test recently where I was talking about that the, the most swinging record I had heard that day was Gene's something Gene blues. was yeah Gene was playing on with the uh, jazz at the Philharmonic. Yeah, uh, he had a marvelous feel, and uh, Roy Roy always talked about Gene's feel too. He loved it, yeah. and uh, that's Roy Aldridge, folks. Uh, and uh, see now, Gene was also accused. Now he was accused of a lot of things. That he used to drag with his foot. Well, see now, the point is this: he's not dragging with his foot. If his top is right on there, his foot isn't dragging. If you listen close, it's echo. It's a room sound. They use the, see uh, the the problem, and even I have the same problem today. Anybody that uses calfskin heads on their drums, first of all, what you're getting is when the temperature is just right, when it's sort of on half damp, humid, a, a certain amount of humidity, the drums sound wonderful. Right. And everything is clean as can be. And you get that thud on the bass drum that is unbeatable. You can't get that anywhere. Uh, you can't get that on a plastic head. You can't get it. With, you don't need muffling. You don't need nothing. You just need a touch. Now, Gene had that. Same as everybody did in those days. You know, When the temperature was right, when right. the humidity was correct, the snare drum would be a little loose, the bass drum would be a little loose, the tom-toms were loose, and you got a great sound out of the drums, and they were fun to play on. But when the drums were too tight, when the, and you had to keep working on them and pulling them down to get the depth out of the bass drum. Right. Okay, these were big drums, too. They didn't make little ones in those days. These, these drums are unmuffled, because good drummers didn't muffle their drums. They knew how to play them. Right. So... The problem is you're playing in these big halls and all that. The drum, and then the mic, there's only one mic for everybody, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a room ambiance feeling that goes, you know, and, this, and there's an echo, right. you know, a room sound. And that's what you're hearing. You're hearing that bass drum coming out late because the heads are hard. You could tell that by how high his tom-toms are and all that. Mm -hmm. Everything is tight. This was, when, when was this recorded? Do you Summer. Record? Summer. In uh, California. Ah, air conditioning. Right. You know, they had it in those days out in California. Right. It didn't matter whether they did or they didn't. It was, the sun might have been, if the sun was beating down on the place, it was hot all day long. Those places were hot. And uh, I used to hate it. I played in, uh, if you played in Denver or in L.A. or in uh, certain places, it was murder, especially uh, after a hot day of the sun. In the winter... You had to contend with the dry heat, right. which we still do. This is I'm talking about the calfskin head. I heard about. I'm sorry. No. Yeah, I'm trying. What I'm trying to do is give Gene more credit. A lot of people were listening to a. They weren't listening to what was really happening. Right. He couldn't be swinging if the bass drum was behind. Right. And that's he was a, swinging. Yeah. Hmm. He was hitting it right where he's supposed to. It's just that's the way the sound. That's a sound sound. You know. I mean, it's yeah. it's uh, it's not it's not exactly accurate. Yeah. It's exactly, but I'll, I'll tell you one thing that's accurate is the time. It's exactly yeah. 7 o'clock, oh. and uh, and this is WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. My name is Lauren Schoenberg, and it's my pleasure to be hosting these three-in-a-row musician show on last Wednesday night, tonight, and next Wednesday, featuring Mel Lewis and the History of Jazz Drums, a series that will be continuing throughout the spring here as we uh, deal with the great jazz drummers, and uh, who better to tell us about them and why they were important than a great jazz drummer himself, Mel Lewis, of course, the Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra, going into their 24th year yeah. at the Village Vanguard every Monday night. And, uh, new recording out on the Music Masters label and a lot of... Which, incidentally, was oh. not nominated. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, I forgot to... Yeah. I got your message, but I was out when talking to Dan, and he told me that you had called them, so I was, like, right there. But, yeah, no, I was, I was very disappointed because they issued your record in time so that it could be nominated. In fact, a lot of people got screwed this year. Oh. Uh, well, the, the, all, the only one was, uh, I think, Bill Holman. Bill Holman was the only record of substance, yeah. or, or what I would call somebody who deserved to be nominated, Yeah, that was nominated. I mean, somebody that has a band. Right, right. You know, uh, because uh, even the Gene Harris band, who did get nominated, that's a pickup band. I mean, right. that was thrown together that's for... That's not a band that spent no, any time. No, it's not a band that spent any right. time. In fact, right. uh, after they made the record, they were sorry they didn't record it back here when they had a better band in the East. Yeah. You know, and they were talking about... I mean, these are things folks that we know about. You know? 
But I mean, it, it just. I thought the just, HAO record might have been nominated too. Well, it should have been in yeah. a way because it's, an, it's also an organized band. You know, yeah. I mean, the point is, is that, is that this has been one of my arguments with uh, Neris for years. Is that, uh, and the people, of course, but it's being run by the West Coast, and, the, and this is again the West Politics. Coast. Politics. It's, it's political. Yeah. So that's why uh, you know. I mean, well, anyway, I know that my record, uh, our record, is one of the finest records out this year. Yeah. As, were, as was the Benny Carter yeah. AJO record, which I'm proud to have been on. You know, yeah. I'd have been happy if any of those. But, I mean, the point is, it's not a matter of winning. It's a matter of being nominated, being recognized yep. for, for, a, for a good effort by, a, by an organization that is trying to keep something happening. Yeah. Not one person uh, enjoy their whim, yeah. you know, like Bob Florence. I mean, who cares, you know. He doesn't make. He makes his living writing arrangements for singers, you know. So every once in a while, uh, he he spends, he indulges in himself and and, and makes a record, you know. Right. And it sounds like a Count Basie record or something, you know. Yeah. I mean, he's a wonderful writer, and I like Bob, but you know, come on. Yeah. There, he didn't put any. Uh, he didn't pay any dues, you know. I mean, you know, if he really wanted to do what we do, then we should be doing it. Yeah. You know. Well, it certainly wasn't the first time that uh and I a felt band sorry. Well, I felt sorry for the guys in my band because they played so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On this record. This record yeah. is so well yeah. recorded and so beautiful and this marvelous solo. It's called Soft Lights and Hot Music yeah. on the Music Master. Well, anyway, label. the record's still out there and it's still yeah. new and it's going to be around for a long time. Oh, it'll be around forever. So we're talking with Mel Lewis. It's three minutes after seven, and again, we're in the midst of uh, the history of jazz drums here. Right now, we're talking about the history of jazz drums in 1989. Yeah, let's get back to where we belong. But here. we're going to go from 1989, <laughs> we're going to go back to 1941. You mentioned Roy Eldridge, and we heard Roy last week uh, in his band with Zooty Singleton on their great record of After You've Gone with those great yeah. hits on four at the end of those breaks. It was so nice the way he let the breaks go. Well, right now, we're going to hear Roy Eldridge uh, as a member of the Gene Krupa band. And this is called Ball of Fire from oh, a that. film of the same title. Right. I remember that film. And uh, just one thing that I'm finding in common with every drummer we've played, from Chick Webb to Zooty Singleton to Krupa to Kaiser Marshall, and, I'm, and it's going to keep going right to the end, is the fact that no matter how many tricks or how many things that these guys can do on their solos and things, by and large, the great majority of the time when the band's playing, they let the band play, whether it's a small That's group or a big band. They let the band do their thing, and they pick their moments very wisely. It's called taste. Right, and yeah. and all the drummers we're investigating had taste to the maximum. That's what made them great. Right. So the and great ones had that. The other ones didn't. And you're just going to hear a very tasteful record, Gene Krupa's Ball of Fire. Again, here's a guy, Gene Krupa, with all the chops in the world, could have been playing over the band and doing a whole bunch of silly stuff. Listen to the way he supports the band, how he picks his spots, and how much him and Roy Eldridge get a nice thing going here. Ball of Fire, 1941, Gene Krupa. Thank you.
those guys playing lead and he had, yeah he had uh, he had some wonderful players playing in his played in his band Sammy Musiker Sammy Musiker Sam Donahue sure uh, Corky Cornelius and yeah. uh, Graham Young right and you know Lyman you know, all those people Lyman Funk Lyman Funk yeah. so eight minutes after seven that was a great record that was a ball of fire tell sure. us about what what he did on there well you know that's that's it and now the way he played on there is the way he played in his own in his band you know i mean he he always got swinging hard and let the band let the band carry you know if you know right. actually it was very much like like a lot like benny's band uh, right. actually this band though uh it swung even harder yeah a little it, looser uh, yeah it was a it was a looser feeling band you know uh well because everybody felt looser right you know, there was nobody uh, glaring at him in front Mm. Uh, you know that makes a difference. But we talked about that once, mm. and uh, Gene just enjoyed himself. You know, he had a good time. Yeah, uh, we were talking about the hi hat. You know, and about different things he did. See, uh, Gene played the hi hat underneath. Uh, his right hand was under. He had his his snare drum tilted very deeply towards and, him, uh, away from him, away from him. Yeah, like. Uh, like Baby Dodds and those guys did, you know, and like uh, Sonny Greer, Greer, uh, people like uh, you know who really does it extreme today is uh, Donald Bailey. He really he he still does it like that, and uh, and uh, so in order to do that, the, the the top of the rim was up so high that in order you'd have to have the hi hat way up in the air, and they did they didn't make they weren't that long. The hi hat wasn't that tall. Right. The hi hat was not a high hat. In those days, today they make them so. I mean, you, you can stand up. You know, I mean, right. it's ridiculous. Everything is so stupidly made today. It was, it was Mark a low hat. That was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was like a reasonable height. So he played underneath. He played with his right hand underneath the left hand. Hmm. So uh, his hi hats were actually below the ho the top rim of the snare drum. Oh okay. God. Yeah. And uh, which accounted maybe also due to the fact that he did a lot of snare drum work. He did play. He played on a lot of like behind Roy. There, he's, he'd get on the snare drum. Yeah, he'd still do that. That's a Gene was never afraid to play his snare drum, in, e even in a modern arrangement of any kind. Yeah, I enjoyed also the uh, on those shout choruses, uh, about two or three of them towards the end. You know, the the varied way that he commented on and, yeah. and did things with the band. It was always you know he picked a great spot. Oh yeah, he just leave a little spot and go. One time he, he did just like throw uh, a little offbeat thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. And he did quarter note triplets for him on the same one, like ba ba ba. Yeah, that he used to. Yeah, that that was a little bit of a trademark. Thing, and then he know. did the he threw in those bass drum hits yeah. in there, very dramatic. What a beautiful sound. Yeah, well his bass drum was tuned. What right. a, I know. I used to, I played on that set. Yeah, what a yeah, beautiful sound. I, yeah, I knew how he how he tuned everything. Tell us about tuning a bass drum. That seems like another lost art. Well, I mean, first what, of all, a bass drum should, well, a bass drum should have nothing in it. Right. A bass drum should be tuned. Well, first of all, you should use calf heads on your bass drum. I mean, you know, if you really want to get a real bass drum sound, right? Uh, you have to have nothing, and you should have nothing in it. I, I use it. I and I remember Cozy Cold in, and, and and you have to have you have a, a calf skin head. I, I use a, a timpani head, uh, a heavy a, a heavy timpani head on the batter side of the head, and a thin calf skin head on the on the uh, outside mm -hmm. and you tune you tune that head uh, the outside head is a little tighter than the than the batter side the batter side should be tuned lower i try to get it as low <laughs> as i can get it yeah. with, without any wrinkles right that's usually the way i tune them and then the front head i do the same thing except once i've got it then i turn it up just a little bit so there's some pitch mm -hmm. then i take a piece of paper napkin and put it over on the side with a little piece of scotch tape or or, a, or some masking tape, and just just to take a, just to take the, the little of the overtone out over on the side mm -hmm. of the outside of the drum, nothing inside, right. and that's it. You know, then you use the biggest beater you can ha you can find. You got to have a big beater and hit that thing right smack in the center of the drum. Mm -hmm. That's where it should hit. Yeah. That's why it's very it's a 20 inch bass drum. It's very easy to hit right in the center. It's perfect for the average pedal. Mm -hmm. A 22 you can do it, but you got to have the beater ball out is just about as far as it'll go mm -hmm. which gives you a little top heaviness there so i i prefer a 20 inch bass drum i use a 16 by 20 with the big band mm -hmm. i find out that that gives me the same uh air sp that gives me the same amount of uh, air space that uh that a 22 inch drum would have a 14 by 22 i have a 16 by 20 mm -hmm. you know? and uh, then you get that more or less that cannon <coughs> effect yeah yeah but you can make any good bass drum sound good if, by just tuning it that way. 
18, 20, you know, 22. Mm -hmm. But when you get it, because when you get it to great big bass drums, you don't need great big bass drums. But in those days, that's all they had. Davy Tuff had a huge one. I've seen yeah, the pictures. Yeah, well, that was a 28. That was yeah. a, that's what Gene and Davy and, and all the guys, that's what they had. When I first started, that's what I had. Yeah. Uh, there was, you had no choice. Uh, and they weren't heavy. The drums were not heavy because they were, they were thin shells. You know, they were made for right. tone. Right. They were like concert bass drums. Yeah. You know, they they were really. And the whole idea was the more you, Davy uh, used was n uh, noted for. Uh, he used to tear newspaper up in strips and throw that inside, mm. like confetti type of stuff. You know, he threw that inside the bass drum. Then he carried. He was fa famous for carrying around a uh, a water can with him. Right. So he could keep it, keep it wet, you right. know, he, to get that soggy feeling that I was, yeah. which you would need whenever you played in areas where you needed it. Yeah. Keep the keep some dampness in there. On records like that, and when Gene played with his band, and we're, we're just about to go to one of the most famous later records. A lot of modern drummers got turned on to Gene, and that was Disc Jockey Jump, which yeah. was a big hit. Uh, what level did he play the bass drum at? Volume wise, would you say medium level? I mean, he, he, was he always playing four of the bar? Yeah, he played four except, of the bar, except when he did those. Except when he stopped to play a, a, a fill punctuation, or something or yeah. yeah, which is what we all do. I mean, you right. know, I mean, I might, I play fancier tricks with the bass drum today than they did in those days. I mean, right. I do it, and other people do it. You know, uh, a lot of drummers don't play their bass drum at all today, and those are the ones who don't swing too well. Yeah, you got to play your bass drum. You know. I mean that—that's where it all comes from, you know. I remember when Tony Williams wouldn't play as he plays it now. He's a little heavy too, but he plays it and he swings much harder because of it. And I—I th I think it's important. I know he's glad he does it, you yeah. know, but in the beginning he couldn't do it, you know. And that's—I'm not talking out of turn. He admits that, you know. Yeah, I mean, sure. but he plays well, it's it an now. art. Yeah. Like when we heard that record uh, last week of the Baby Dodds drum solos. And you mentioned about how he kept that beautiful level going forward yeah. the bar in the bass drum, about how a lot of drummers can do a lot of fancy stuff, but couldn't play 32 four. measures forward to the bar with an even tone, you know. Yeah. Well, most of your rock yeah. drummers can't play four beats in one bar. <laughs> and yet they can play all that fancy stuff, you yeah. know, and, and they practice that all day long, but they cannot keep play four even beats, which is what swing is all about, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right, right now we're going to carry on and, and hear our last Gene Krupa recording. This is the band Mel was referring to. It was kind of a bebop band that Mel had. And this is, I guess, one of the, the first uh, big Gene, hitter Gene had. Mel pff, <laughs> Gene Krupa had. And this is one of the first, the first big hit, I guess, for Jerry Mulligan. This is yep. Disc Jockey Jump, and Mulligan must have been a teenager or something like that he was, at that he point. He was only around 19 when he really wrote this. <laughs> wrote a masterpiece. Buddy Wise on the tenor, Charlie Kennedy on the alto, and I'm forget, not sure who the trumpet is. Uh, that's Fagerquist. Don Fagerquist. Oh, oh, it might it might be Red. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. Anyway, we get to hear uh, Krupp interpreting kind of an early bebop arrangement and sounding just so tasteful and so beautiful on it.
see. Now, now that was pro that was one of the first uh, that was one of the fir er, early bebop records, a big band. You know, it came out that was early around 46. Four, early uh, early forties, you know, middle forty. Uh, that was Red Rodney, by the way. Right, I'm positive, and that was I think it was uh, Leon Cox on trombone. I recall the members of the band at that time. Buddy Wise was a wonderful young tenor player at that time. It's, we lost him to junk, as uh, there's no hiding that. That's what happened to him. Uh, years later, actually, Charlie Kennedy is uh, who I worked with on uh, worked with on the coast. Uh, was a member that he's on that all those Terry Gibbs yes. Dream Band stuff. Yeah. But Charlie just he got fed up with that scene out there, and he just quit playing again for a second time. So he's. He's working Where in is a he? tire in factory or something. California? Like yeah. And uh, it was a shame because he was one of the, also one of the great young alto players of the, of the 40s, you know, out of the Parker tradition. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he played tenor too. But on the, on the band, he played alto. Uh, he played some tenor. He played tenor on a, on a Bill Holman record. I know, I, I know I've seen his name yeah. on tenor. Yeah, he surprised. played tenor on, yeah. But, but alto was his thing. He played yeah. alto. I mean, he was... Everybody, he was sort of a, a nice cat too, Charlie. And uh, anyway, uh, that band, yeah. Now there's where you hear the, the taste that Gene had. You know, uh, here was a guy that was caught in the middle of a situation. You know, I mean, he's a, he's Gene Krupa. He's been around for years now. He's he's got a style. Uh, he came out of the swing era. He's not a bebopper, but he wants to have a bebop band. He wants a modern band. He wants to play modern, but how do you make that transition? I mean, how could he have done it? He yeah. couldn't, really, you know. So the only one thing he could do is what he did, play with as much taste as possible, you know. And uh, I used to go to, those were the days when I was on the scene pretty strong, and I, I spent a lot of time with the band, you know, hanging out with him and all that. And and uh, I was traveling here and there, and because 46 is when I first went on the road, you know. And I used to run into him all the time, and uh, I was always knocked out with the band. I never felt that anything was ever lacking, and I always thought that. And that's when he was starting to use a. That's when he started using a ride symbol. I mean, really using it. You know, that's when Gene finally went to putting up a big symbol on his bass drum. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that was the only change he made. The showmanship thing of Gene Krupa that. Uh Turned a lot of people on and turned some other people off. Well, but you, know. but you want to? Uh, it's my feeling. I did. I knew the man fleetingly, only for a, a year or so, and didn't know him well at all. You knew him very well for a long period of time. It seemed to me that showmanship was a very natural thing for him. It was totally natural. It wasn't a for put him. on or like no, a show no. thing. I know it wasn't because because he was using it when I first met him when I was a little boy, you know, and uh, it seemed like a natural thing to him. Yeah, you know, and when you and when you and and if you look back, it was a it was a it wasn't that much. No, just some funny faces. Ah, he made some faces, you know, and he used to chew gum, you know, right. and and uh, and uh, the mutter the things. Yeah, and the hair flying in the face and all that. I mean, that's because that that was it. The hair was there, yeah. <laughs> you know, and he was sweating, you know, yeah. and uh, we all did. Everybody sweat. I mean, if you want to be bored watching somebody like me, fine, you know. Uh, I made things look too easy. Uh, Dave Tuff made it look too easy. You know, I mean, Gene, he didn't make it look hard. Right. He just, that was just the way he did it, you know. Yeah. Because I used to, because I used to, uh, I'd be sitting up there, sometimes I'd be standing on the side of the bandstand uh, watching him work, and he's talking to the, he'd be talking to the guys in the band while he's playing along, you know, he's smiling and, and remembering something funny. He'd look over at me and he'd, He'd nod to me to look out at the audience because there was something funny going on out in the audience, right. or he'd or he'd nod to me to dig so and so is going to play you know the solo that's going to so and so is going to listen to this new guy I got and mm -hmm. so on. He was like that, you know, mm. and uh, you know and and, uh, and and once in a while and when he there were certain figures uh, where the band would play stops. He he used to love uh, de uh, breaks right. like. Ba da da, ba. You know nothing in between. Right. Now, that's hard. You got to be careful in there. You know, no fill, nothing, and mm. the band would have to hit, and and that's when he would do something dramatic with his arms or something. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. He yeah he'd <laughs> put him up in the air or something like that. Right. Uh, but he wouldn't play anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it would be just silence. Yeah. And then when the band would hit, of course he'd come down with his hands right. uh, onto the right. cymbals or something. Uh, 
That's and that would emphasize. So in, in a way, it was a fill. Yeah. A, a visual fill, you yeah. know, things like that. So, and I think that all helped. I think it just helped, you know. But I mean, but, but he was not a show-off, right. you know. Yeah, there's a big difference there. Yeah. I remember seeing, uh, there's a film of him doing something where he does a break like that with the, I guess this image I have in my mind of him going with the hands up in the air yeah. and hitting the bass drums or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like not with the hands. Like, you yeah. see the hands go up and nothing's happening. Yeah, you know, I mean, different guys would do the, uh, you know. Why and, not, right? I mean, listen, if that's you know, if, it, if, if it comes naturally to you. Sonny Greer would uh, look to the left while he hit something to the right. I mean, you know, it's just, right. these are things guys would do, you know, just yeah. just to look sharp, you know. Well, it's one of my, my own, the, on, the only story I can tell about playing with Sonny Greer was playing Body and Soul one night, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I had my eyes closed and hadn't been playing very long at the time, and all of a sudden the audience is laughing. My eyes are closed playing a ballad. No idea what's going on. I thought my fly was open or <laughs> a, a rabbit was on my shoulder. I had no idea what was going on. So I turned around, I look, and Sonny Greer was playing drums. He was doing this thing where he used to open up his coat, like, yeah. he'd open up the coat from the left and from the right, and then he'd, like, swing the brush around on his yeah. hands and all that kind of showmanship stuff. It was amazing that he could do all that stuff and never interfere with the music. That's it. And, know. of course, we're really going to get into that on the next show, talk about a cliffhanger when we talk about Big Sid Catlett. Yeah. Now, there's the perfect example Sid used of... used to have all these routines he did. But yet you listen to, like, Steak Face. And, yeah. And... Uh, I'm going to save that. That's, yeah, that's too exciting. All right. 725, Lauren Schoenberg here with Mel Lewis, and it's the history of jazz drums. And you're listening to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. If I was Bob Hope, I'd say this is Lauren. I have a cold Schoenberg. It's a little <laughs> stuffed up here. But we're, we're coming to you in stereo, and we're going to go from Gene Krupa to a drummer who actually predates him in the chronology, uh, both in the birth date and also in uh, jazz drumming, and that's the great... Sonny Greer. Right. And right now we're going to listen to a Sonny Greer recording, uh, Black Beauty. This is 1928. It's a Victor recording, and it's important because, and uh, we'll talk more about this later, the fact that it's one of the very first recordings where the piano, bass, and drums function as a rhythm section. It's not the way that you're used to hearing it, but if you can listen to it freshly and without any... Uh, without any prejudices of the s surface noise of the 78 or the fact that it's a 60-year-old record, almost a 60-year-old, uh, uh, 61-year-old recording. Uh, the fact that actually I think it has a lot in common with some of the more modern things that have been going on in music because they're all doing their own thing musically. It's, mm -hmm. it's not about just keeping 4-4 four, four time. But anyway, enough talk. Let's listen to Black Beauty, we'll focus in on Sonny Greer on the drums, and I think the most appropriate summation of Sonny Greer was the one that Duke Ellington made when he said that for every ping the band made, Sonny made the appropriate pong. Well, that's right. <laughs> right. Wrong record queued up. Want to vamp for a minute while I get the right one? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, what are, what are, what are we going to do now? Very good joke. The, the, the I don't know any good SPS, jokes. The Sonny Greer record. Oh, okay. I had the wrong one up there. Oh, what was that? But the w the wrong one I had up was for time reasons a drummer who we weren't going to get to play, but one who I want to mention was uh, that Joe Jones was very fond of Walter Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah. And he was known as Stickin. I've heard two things. He was known as Stickin Brush because he played with a stick and a, a brush. A stick and a brush. <laughs> and uh, Harold Austin, a drummer friend of mine. I remember, yeah, I knew Harold Austin. Yeah, well, he's, he's still going strong, and he was Harold's talking to me the other day. He was with ha Jonah Jones. Right, for years. Yeah, yeah. and he told me that uh, that uh, one of Walter Johnson's tricks was he'd play a tune like the one we have right there, the uh, Limehouse Blues with Fletcher Henderson's band, Fast Tempo, Never Sweat. And at the end of the tune, he'd put down the drumsticks and pick, pick up a little uh, handkerchief and kind of yeah. mop his brow. Very, <laughs> very cool, you know? yeah. So we should just pay tribute just by name to Walter Johnson. Yeah, at least, drummer. at least. Did you did you see him or no? He was. No, I don't know if I saw him or not. I don't think so. Probably. But, but probably you heard, but you not. heard of him. Oh, heard sure. Of his reputation, of course. Yeah, one of the very early light, nice drummers. Okay, yeah. now Sonny Greer and Black Beauty. Thank you. 
Black Beauty, the original band recording. I think the, one of Duke's early piano solos was on Black Beauty. This was the full band version from 1928. Mel, any comments? Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about now. I could understand uh, in, in the middle section there, during the rhythm section, uh, the, the, uh, the, the concept of, uh, of uh, creation, yeah. uh, of, uh, you know, instead of just playing straight ahead, they all they all contributed a little solo on solo, yeah. Uh, and you know, and, and as you and I were talking while it was playing, uh, uh, the, the idea you brought up about uh, you know the fr the free concept of playing, which is supposedly uh, so fresh and new today, you know. Right. Uh, well, I don't think anything is fresh and new today, you know. Anyway, it's just it's just what it is is the concept. The way they played in those days, I mean, it sounds hokey to us today, you know. But it wasn't hokey then. No. It was very modern then. Yeah. So what's modern today, uh, you know, will yeah. sound hokey uh, for 60 years from now, too, you right. know. So uh, let's, let's look at looking at it from that angle.